Hi y'all and welcome back to the garden. So I want to correct an error first of all. So if you watched a video, I think it's going to be a couple videos ago now, where I installed those thread branch cypress up front. I read the tag incorrectly and I had a viewer comment that those get really large. And so I went back and looked at the tag again and it said they got 12 foot tall and wide, not 12 inches tall and wide. And so I have removed those and I replaced them with some different evergreens that I picked up this weekend that I want to show you. Um, I went to the garden center and just found all the tiny little evergreens I could find and kind of created some diversity in my garden as far as evergreens are concerned. And so we'll go take a look at those briefly in a moment. It is very windy outside, so hopefully you can hear me. Uh, the winds from the hurricane are kind of blown in, but we also generally have really windy fall weather. And so you can probably see maybe how windy the garden is in the video as we go along. But uh, at the end of this video, I'm going to go inside and we're going to make my grandmother's uh, lemon pound cake. And so my dad and brother are here and I'll walk you through the recipe and the steps to create that. It's really delicious and it's not something that you want to eat if you're on a diet because the ingredients are really heavy, but it is incredible and I haven't made it in a couple years. It's kind of a special occasion thing. So let's go take a look around the garden first. So for the first thing here, I redid the space from the last video, which I left a comment on. I removed, I had four of these total mango salsa roses here and I removed the two that were on this side and went ahead and put this Japanese maple here. So this Japanese maple is a Rhode Island red and the tag says it can get six to eight foot tall and wide. I showed you in a prior video that it's branching is really dense and so I think I can keep it selectively pruned so it only gets maybe three to four foot tall and then gets a little wider here so it'll kind of, it might kind of reach out into the lawn just a little bit or I can keep it pruned just over these inkberry hollies here that are eventually going to be a nice little evergreen hedge hopefully uh, and then these roses may end up coming out later but I did stick the Hershey white pine right here which I showed in the last video too this thing grows incredibly slow. And so I think when I saw the tag or saw online when I purchased it, it only gets uh, maybe like two foot tall and wide. Really, really slow growing. So I think it'll be a nice blue uh, foliage color next to these Red Rover Hookra here and all of the other colors that we're playing off. So we've got the Rising Sun Red Bud, which has both yellow and orange. It's kind of slowing down for the summer, so the leaves aren't as orangey as they've been most of the year. You can see it a little bit here, but um, it'll look nice here, I think, with all of this other stuff. I did plant the Wine and Spirits Wygela back here in the back, and so we'll still have the dark blacker foliage back there in the back, but I really loved this Japanese maple, and having it up front uh, will be a really pretty accent, I think. So, that's how this space has changed a little bit. I will probably come through here and plant just some perennials in the space to fill in. That will be filler plants uh, for a few years until some of this stuff crawls out a little more. So I want to discuss filler plants briefly for a moment uh, during this video. Filler plants are something that some people might consider annuals. I have a different view of filler plants than some people might. Some of the views might be similar but I use, in some instances, shrubs as filler plants. A lot of instances, perennials for me are filler plants. I've mentioned that I don't like to purchase a lot of annuals. And when you have spaces around plants that you want to fill in, sometimes you fill those with annuals. Annuals in my garden don't tend to do as well. We have a lot of that heavy clay soil. Heavy clay does not permit root growth to develop really quickly. And so annuals don't tend to thrive in those conditions in my experience in my garden. So I will put perennials in those locations knowing that in a few years they will have to be moved. Um, in some instances, I'll place lots of small shrubs. There's lots of great shrubs out there. I've showed you many on this channel that stay really small that may end up having to be moved or, you know, I'm going to treat them as a three or four year investment and then they'll come out and be given to a friend. Uh, that's just the way I operate. And so... When you see me planting things really closely, know that I'm not afraid to move stuff later if I have to. As you've seen, I've been doing uh, a lot this season. And also just understand that because I can't really use a whole lot of annuals in the ground, even my zinnias that I planted this year did not do great. Uh, typically, I've had really strong years with zinnias, but this was not one of them. 
So I just don't typically have great luck with annuals in the ground. And so I have to use those perennials in locations or small shrubs in locations where I know there's not, it's not going to be their final resting place, so to say. Uh, they will probably get moved. But until the shrub that I planted that I do want to fill that space gets big enough, uh, they will fill that space for me and provide some ground cover to protect the ground. It may be some bloom if I'm looking for some bloom in that location or it may just be a foliage texture that fills that location until the big plant grows up. So that's just kind of how I see filler plants. I'm gonna take you around and show you some more of the evergreens that I planted. All of these evergreens stay really tiny. And so that's something I wanted to focus on. I don't have a lot of room to plant really big evergreens in my garden. I've seen some that I would love to have, but I just, I, I don't have the space for them. So I focused on all things that get, uh, mostly in a globe form that doesn't get bigger than two to three foot wide. I have one that doesn't get bigger than one and a half foot wide. Now let's go take a look at those right quick. So this one you have seen before. This is uh, Fire Chief Arborvitae. This will get two to three foot tall and wide like I mentioned. So it will creep into this lavender just a little bit, but it will fill kind of this void here eventually. And so I have some alliums next to it. This is a tiny, tiny Yigela. It stays only one to two foot tall and wide in a butterfly bush. And so I think it will fit perfectly right here. And so we'll move on to the next one because this is one I've showed in my garden recently. This evergreen is Mr. Bowling Ball. And so this is a Bobo Hydrangea in front of it. I mentioned a prior video ago that I'm gonna be removing. So you'll kind of have to ignore the spacing for right now. I just haven't had a chance to move this and give it away but it's gonna fill in a two to three foot area too. It tends to get a little wider than it does tall, and so I really like the foliage textures against each other too of this Japanese maple. So as this Japanese maple creeps out, this will creep in and they'll kind of mix here next to each other. And I think that'll be a really nice touch here. This one's really interesting. It's Anna's Magic Ball, which I've seen for several years and I've just not added it to my garden. So this is the one that only gets about one and a half tall and wide. It's gonna grow into a natural ball shape, kind of like the little arborvitae, little giant arborvitae that I've showed you. And then I picked out this plant called Brigadoon St. John's Wort. And now I had a viewer comment and mention that this might be a good plant for this location. And I've seen this plant before, and when she mentioned it, I was like, yes, that's a great option. So it plays off that color uh, that I'm trying to get in this location. So it'll be a really striking contrast to this Midnight Sun Yigela here, uh, and it stays a brighter yellow color in summer. You can see it's getting some of its autumn foliage right here as it's turning a little more yellow. This is a really ground-hugging St. John's wort, and so I've showed you the other St. John's worts in this bed that produce the berries. This is more in the perennial section in my garden center. I think it acts as more a perennial and it's just gonna be a nice front border plant along with this groundhog aronia here. And I think as this border fills in, uh, it will be a nice stair step of plants that just kind of get larger as we go to the back. That's what I was looking for in this design as well as just beautiful shrubs that provided color. So most everything in this bed will be shrubs. Uh, and I'm really excited about how it's looking, even this early in the stage. I have come through and put a few of those boxwoods that I got for a dollar. Uh, so there's one here that I think will look nice and I can keep trimmed to a tiny ball right here at the front of the border. And then I stuck another one here and then another one right here that I think also as nice tight spears will look nice and integrate some evergreen interest, some more evergreen interest into this border because we already have the Fire Chief Arborvitae back there, and these uh, Emerald Green Arborvitae, so those are evergreens. But just to have some more interest, I think some nice tight boxwood spheres for the front of the border and the mid of the border will look really nice in these locations as well. So I'm going to come through and probably get these boxwoods planted today in this location. And then as spring rolls around, I may get these pruned up. I might try and prune them now. My concern now is we're getting a bit cool, but um, shaping them up a little bit will probably be beneficial because I have, in my experience, these boxwoods still tend to grow a little bit over winter. And so if I give them a nice pruning now, that will encourage branching as we head into fall. This is an interesting little evergreen that I saw that I just kind of wanted to add to this location. It's a little uh, spiky. So it's a juniper gold cone is the variety name and it's supposed to have yellow 
uh, needles in the spring and emerge yellow and kind of transition to this bluer later in the summer. But I thought it would be really cute next to this uh, tater tot arborvitae, which will be like this perfect little ball right here. And then we'll have some upright. I think this gets one and a half foot wide by four-ish foot tall, maybe four to five foot tall. But I think it's just really nice texture. Uh, color contrast to this, and then we'll have the rose behind here and the clematis, which you can see on the ground back here. I did get a few blooms out of this year, but clematis take a little while to get going. And so I'm going to pull this bloom off just to show you what it looks like and the combination we'll have in future years. I've been complaining kind of in recent videos about all the rain we've had uh, these past few weeks, and now we've gone at least about a week and a half without any significant rainfall. And now it's causing problems because although the temperatures aren't that high, the wind has been ferocious and wind can be just as damaging and drying as hot sunlight. And since I've transplanted a lot of these plants, they're already exhibiting a, or they already have a smaller root system. And in many cases, now they're having to deal with winds that are also rough and can cause water loss. So I have one more small, tiny evergreen that I wanna show you. This is more decorative than anything else. It only gets about one to one and a half foot wide and three foot tall. And I think it's gonna be really cute next to my garden chair. And this is it. It's just called Juniper Miniature. And you can see the texture here. Uh, it's gonna be growing along the perennials and the strawberries here. So it, it came as a one gallon. And I just think it's really cute and darling. And it's right here next to my garden chair. So the weather has been kind of cool and I'm gonna try and get some more things transplanted. I, I, my goal would be is to finish getting everything that's in a container in the garden this week. I don't have any more larger shrubs except those boxwoods I just showed you. I have some plugs remaining for this incredible hydrangea hedge border that I started uh, later, earlier this summer, kind of late in the summer and just never got around to finishing. And so that will be the priority this week because the plugs need to get in the ground before we have our first frost. Else I risk more likely losing them than anything else this winter. So we'll go inside because it's still super windy and we'll get started on my grandmother's pound cake. And welcome to the kitchen. So I already have in here uh, one and a half cups of Crisco. So I mentioned outside that this is a good cake if you're on a diet and you wanna come off a diet because nothing in it is really healthy, but it's really delicious. And so I will put the recipe on the screen and also in the comments or description below. But we're gonna start out with one and a half cups of melted Crisco. And to that, we're gonna add three cups of sugar. I have pure cane sugar uh, from Costco here. And we'll add it a little bit at a time. After you've got those incorporated, you're gonna add nine large eggs, one at a time, very slowly. So while this is mixing, we're going to incorporate a teaspoon of vanilla extract and a teaspoon of lemon extract. So one thing, I am a very messy baker, and so we're going to incorporate this flour as slowly as possible so it doesn't go everywhere, and hopefully we don't make a mess. This is three cups of cake flour, by the way. I only spilled a little, so that's really success. So while this is finishing up right here, I coat the cake pan with a little bit of the leftover Crisco uh, I just did it with a brush, a uh, kitchen brush, and then spread some cake flour in there so it looks like this, and then we'll pour the cake in there when, we're, when it's all done. And this is what you should be left with. And we'll just pour it evenly into the cake pan here. You do want to use a bunt pan. Uh, I've never made it any other way but with a bunt pan, so 
it would probably come out either way, but it's a real dense cake, so it probably needs uh, that heat to enter around the center or it may not cook as fully. So you want to give it a moment to let it settle and then you're going to put it in the oven 325. I'm cooking mine on the convection setting. It can be cooked on the regular setting in your oven. Um, so I think at 325 it actually gets to 300 degrees in my oven on the convection. And you want to bake it for an hour and a half. And so after the hour and a half is over, you let it sit an additional 30 minutes before you remove it. So I'm going to put it in here and then we'll be back in a moment. All right, everyone, we've got it out of the oven. It's been sitting for probably 40-ish minutes at this point, but it's still a little warm to the touch. So now the moment of truth and the part that I'm always scared for when I'm baking anything is seeing if we can get it out of this pan. Uh, this pan hasn't been used in a while, and this is the only thing I've ever made in this pan, but sometimes it sticks. So we'll just try and see if we can get it out easily. Typically, I run a butter knife around the edge of it, just to make sure it's released from the bottom because this pan, the bottom comes off and then I'll see if I can get the bottom out. So I had a little sticking. It's still pretty warm. It probably could cool a little longer, but let's see if we can get it off. And this, guys, is the final result. So you can take some like confectioner sugar and a little bit of milk and uh, vanilla flavoring with some lemon flavoring and um, or lemon extract and vanilla extract and create like a glaze for this. I've done that in the past. I'm not doing that today, uh, but it's a really nice crumb, as you might can hear here, and. It's really yummy. So if you want to try it out, the recipe's below. Thank you guys for joining me. And remember, in a world full of hate, be a light. Take care, everyone. Bye.